Um, so we have a guest lecturer today. Uh, this is Laura Ritchie. Uh, she taught uh, in advanced topics last year over nutrition, so we, we brought her back, and she has a great lecture for y'all. Um, and so she's going to uh, be discussing this. And you know, the, with uh, Laura, we actually went to PT school together. We both went to the Amarillo campus. So she's been a PT for the past 10 years, and uh, she has experience in orthopedics and women's health. And she also um, has a, a side business where she um, is a uh, wellness coach for women with, uh, uh, for, you know, giving them kind of encouragement on uh, exercise and uh, also healthy eating and everything. So she's going to bring some of that material to you today. So um, go ahead and give her your full attention. Uh, and one last note, I think y'all, if y'all have been on the hub, you saw the announcement for the ergonomics assignment. Um, so I want to get get y'all started on that, uh, just so y'all can plan ahead for that, but I think it's going to be a, a fun assignment. Uh, let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be, but the, the resources that I gave you uh, has everything everything you need to do for the, the assignment, okay? So just read through that, and uh, y'all be sure to let me know if you have any questions on anything, okay? Without further ado, thanks, Dr. Ritchie. I think so. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. Lebeck Odessa, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up. Hopefully you're all awake after lunch. Yes, good. Okay, awesome. It's so fun to be here. This was my campus, Amarillo campus, so it's like coming back home. Yeah, woohoo! <laughs> we have to do what we can to stay awake after lunch, right guys? So it's a thrill to be here. And yeah, as Dr. Gehring mentioned, I'm a PT. I specialize in pelvic floor and women's health. I'm also a women's health functional nutrition coach and a national board certified health and wellness coach. So I love this transition to functional nutrition. We didn't get anything like this in PT school, so I'm thrilled that Dr. Gehring invited me to come and teach. And I'm going to share a little bit about my story with you guys and why I came to this world of functional nutrition. It was through my own journey. So I'm going to be very open and authentic and raw with you guys. Back in 2011, so I was just a PT for three years. And I was diagnosed with an extremely rare sarcoma called a desmoid tumor. These are very, very rare. Two to four out of a million people get them. So with odds like that, I said I should have bought a lotto ticket, right? <laughs> they actually eat through soft tissue, anything, muscle, joint, nerve. They are very, very aggressive. And it was in my left rectus abdominis muscle, which you guys can see on the CT scan. From the time when they did this scan to when I had the surgery, it rapidly grew from golf ball to racquetball size to softball size. And I was told, I had surgery here in Amarillo at BSA, that we got it all and it's not a desmoid tumor. And two weeks later, I got a call from your surgeon. If you ever get a call directly from your surgeon, guys, it's not good news. <laughs> and he said, Laura, we didn't get it all and it is a desmoid tumor. So I went on this journey in my 20s with cancer and I thought I was super healthy. And this was a big wake-up call for me. So I named my tumor Harold. That's Harold there on the top. Uh, that you can see I had a big vertical incision. And about a year after they had took the tumor out, it was so large and had eaten through my left rectus that they had to fill my abdominal wall with synthetic mesh. The synthetic mesh caused me chronic pain for a year. And then a year almost exactly to the date, my abdomen blew up to that size that you see at the bottom, swelled up. I thought, oh my gosh, the tumor is back. It was actually a hernia. So I had another surgery to repair a hernia, and then a couple weeks after that, it herniated again. So I had to go to a specialist in Dallas and have a complex abdominal wall reconstruction. Okay, very, very big surgery. They removed all the synthetic mesh, released the fascia and my obliques to close a 12 centimeter ventral hernia. I was in the hospital for five days. They put drains in me. You can see my drains um, there as well, kind of hanging down, and I was 20 pounds less than what I am now. I was very, very underweight, very, very sick from that hernia. So I started looking for options, and this tumor is so rare, we actually ended up going down to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, because here in Amarillo, Texas, they said, we've never seen this before. What we want to do is start radiation. We're going to remove your ovaries, put them in your armpits, and radiate. And I thought, that doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> no to the no. Let me get a second opinion. So we went to MD Anderson Cancer Center where they actually have a team that specializes in this type of very rare 
tumor, the sarcoma. And they told me, Laura, you're too young for radiation. We do that. It's going to fry your ovaries. It can fry your bowel, cause more complications. We're going to do a wait and see approach with scans every six months. So that's what I started. And the top minds in MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I have to put me on camera here so that you guys can see me in Lubbock and Odessa, because this is just too good not to share. The top minds in MD Anderson Cancer Center, I said, hey, what can I do to prevent this from coming back? They said, your occurrence rate's 50%. That's flipping a coin. That's not very good odds. So I said, okay, what about diet? What about lifestyle? And he said, no, just keep eating the standard American diet. <laughs> I said, I'm pretty sure that's how I got sick in the first place. Thank you very much. So I started looking for options and went on this journey. Now, the fun doesn't stop there, right, guys, when it rains, it pours. So I found that I started having hip pain, and I thought the tumor was back. And they said, no, this is to do with your hips. Turns out I had bilateral labral tears, bilateral cam and pincher impingement, a subspine impingement of the AIIS, all due to adult hip dysplasia. Now, in PT school... I did not know that there was such thing as adult hip dysplasia. We usually hear about that in pediatrics, right? They're screening for that in children, not in young adults. I was like, man, the good news just keeps on rolling, guys. Okay, what do we do for this? And they said, well, it's, it's because of the acetabulum was so far antiverted and the femoral head was retroverted. So I had this lack of anterior coverage, typically in adult hip dysplasia, it's lack of lateral coverage. They said, Laura, you need a periacetabular osteotomy. You guys know what that means, right? Peri around the acetabulum, osteotomy to break the bone. So they actually fracture your pelvis in three places, separate the acetabulum, reposition to give you better joint coverage, and then put in large screws to hold that all in place. This is much bigger than hip replacement, as you can see. It's lots of fun, let me tell you. <laughs> so I was on a walker for six weeks. Nothing more humbling than that, right? I had taught patients how to use a walker and crutches, but now I was the one on a walker and rehabilitating. And so that was quite the journey there. And then I started changing my diet. I got my own health coach and noticed improvement, but I was still having daily headaches and fatigue. And Western medicine told me you have chronic fatigue syndrome, you have fibromyalgia, there's nothing we can really do for you. And I knew I was eating too clean to feel that way. I'm in a nutritional endocrinology practitioner training program. We learned about Lyme disease. I went and got tested because I had a lot of the symptoms. Found out I had Lyme, chronic Lyme disease at this point. So those rashes that you see on my back, that's a Bartonella rash. That's a co-infection of Lyme disease. Very, very painful. And that top picture of my hands, just changing my diet. This was before I even started treatment for chronic Lyme. Just changing my diet. I used to take showers and baths, and my joints would swell up and get inflamed and be really red and painful. And just changing my diet, you can see the difference in my hand. I started tracking and monitoring my symptoms. So I was put on very high doses of vitamin C, B vitamins, Myers cocktails, working to heal myself and becoming open to holistic remedies like nutrition, essential oils, functional medicine, functional nutrition to heal my body. And I can tell you I would not be doing the work that I'm doing or up here teaching today if it was not for this holistic approach with this. So that is where I came from. So when I tell you that this stuff works, I really do mean it and I practice what I preach. And it's been such a journey, but I'm so much better than I was before by implementing a lot of these things. So in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about what functional nutrition is, identifying nutrient-dense foods and the health benefits from them, explaining those benefits of eating organic food. There is a difference there, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about food sensitivities. That was something that came up for me. I had was undiagnosed with celiac disease, which I didn't find out later until genetic testing, and that played into some of my health issues and overall health recommendations that are safe for your patients. And you guys are the best people to do that, right? Because you have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with your patients. You're seeing them regularly. You've built that trust and that relationship with them. And then identifying ways to enhance digestion, promote optimal health, and then really helping when you have a specific health condition when people should consider doing an elimination diet with that too. So what's functional nutrition? We've been talking about that a lot. I've been saying those words a lot. Well, the American Nutrition Association defines it as a nutrition-based health care that is focused on building health by restoring proper physiological functioning of the body. And I loved this definition, too, that functional nutrition at its best both examines the balance of our personal dietary landscape 
and seeing how well we're nourishing our body's needs and targeting those specific foods that may have particularly potent impact to address the subtle and not so subtle dysfunctions that we harbor. So basically, it's looking at the person as a whole and treating the underlying root cause. So what does that mean, eating real food? We hear that thrown around a lot. It means whole, unprocessed, and unrefined food. There's been some really interesting studies showing that emulsifiers that are used in our packaged foods, they actually increase intestinal permeability or leaky gut. That was an issue that I had coming up a lot, and we're going to talk about that in way more detail too. Things that are pasture-raised and wild, so things like grass-fed beef, these actually have higher levels of several vitamins and minerals that we're going to go into. And grass-fed bison actually has four times more selenium than, than grain-fed bison. So there's some really interesting research that shows it is more nutrient-dense. We get more bang for our buck with that and what's being absorbed by what we're eating. And then also ideally eating local, seasonal, and organic. And we're going to dive deeper into all of this too. So foods to eat for overall health and well-being, clean protein sources like we talked about, and we're going to go into detail with all of these, eating more vegetables. Your mom was right, guys. <laughs> vegetables are good for us. We want to be incorporating more of those. Lower glycemic fruits, healthy fats. We need fat in our life. The 80s really did us in with that whole low-fat craze, nuts and seeds, gluten-free whole grains for some people that have a sensitivity, legumes and beans. We're going to talk about that again for some people. Sea vegetables, very, very good, very high in iodine, bone broths, natural sweeteners, and hydration, which is also really important. So sources of clean protein. Again, things that are wild, wild-caught game, wild-caught fish and seafood. You can see that list all there. Again, ideally organic and free-ranged is going to be best. You want to avoid meats with the added hormones, antibiotics, and nitrates. So if you could only start one place, on your journey, start with investing in organic protein and getting the grass-fed beef without the hormones, without the nitrates. That really, really will make a difference. We are, we are what we eat, what they ate. So if they're pumping the cows full of antibiotics and hormones, that's going to show up for us. Think about how many women are struggling with endometriosis, are struggling with infertility, with hormonal problems, with issues with their immune system and leaky gut. If those animals have been pumped full of the antibiotics to keep them alive because cows are supposed to eat grass, right? Not grain, not corn, not a bunch of stuff that fattens them up quickly to make a profit, that's gonna affect us. So it's coming back to nature with a lot of these things. Vegetables, more vegetables the better. So there's there's different types. We have starchy vegetables. These are our root vegetables, things like yams, sweet potatoes, cassava, plantains. And we got our non-starchy vegetables. There's a whole list there for you guys. These are things that you typically think about vegetables. And ideally, 75% of your plate should be those non-starchy vegetables. This is where you're going to get your vitamins from, your minerals, you get calcium from your vegetables. It really helps with phase two liver detoxification, which is really important, especially with estrogen dominance. So a lot of women, and I'll come back to women a lot because that's what I specialize in my practice, but estrogen is that building up hormone. So things like fibroids, cysts, endometriosis, where we really want to help to detoxify and get that harmful estrogen out of the body. Vegetables, especially leafy greens, are really, really important and good for that. And we want to eat a rainbow. Variety is the spice of life. So lots of deep, deep, dark, leafy greens. We want to see a really beautiful rainbow on your plate. Now, a caution I will say with nightshade vegetables, and this is more of my clinical experience with this, but for some people, not everybody, right? There's an exception to every rule, but for some, nightshades like tomatoes, red bell peppers, eggplants, potatoes, that's white potatoes, not sweet potatoes actually, but the white potatoes and corn, those can be problematic for some people, especially with joint or spine pain. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. That's a little clinical pearl with people. If you're doing PT on them, you're not seeing results with that, you may consider a two-week elimination diet of nightshades. I had a client, she was actually a PT herself, she had really bad SI pain, and she was seeing a really great pelvic floor physical therapist who was also trained in ortho, working with them, and wasn't seeing much of a difference, so we tried eliminating nightshades. 
And we did that for two weeks and her husband was actually a professional chef. So this was really hard for him <laughs> because he loved the spices and the peppers and all of those things. And her pain went away. And he thought, I'm gonna try this, maybe this is placebo. So he gave it a little while and then he tried to sneak in some pepper into a dish that he was making and it came back. So interestingly enough there, it's just a little clinical pearl. If you've got somebody with that joint or spine pain specifically, maybe worth doing a two week elimination diet on that. The World Health Organization actually recommends 10 servings of fruit and vegetables a day. But according to the Harvard School of Public Health, the average American consumes only three servings of fruits and vegetables. So we have some work to do in this area. Start slowly too, I should say that, because you're not gonna like me very much if you go from eating no fiber to a lot of fiber. <laughs> so with everything, slow and steady, those little changes add up to big ones. Fermented vegetables, these are really important too. So these have that good, high quality probiotic foods that are gonna support your gut health. So things like sauerkraut and kimchi and yogurt kefir, seed yogurts, kombucha. So for those of you guys, this is an example of kombucha. So it's a fermented tea that has those good gut bugs and probiotics in there to support your gut health. There's more of them than there is us. And the majority of your serotonin is actually produced in the gut. So the more things that we can do to help that, not only can it help our overall health, but also our mood. It's really, really interesting. So if you guys haven't tried some kombucha, give it a try, miso. These are foods that are traditionally used. Lots of different cultures have their own fermented foods. So before we had refrigeration, this was how they stored these foods. And it's really amazing to help and support our immune system. So lower glycemic fruit, and not everybody, but I will say the majority of clients that come to see me, there's an underlying insulin resistance. And we can actually catch that by tracking their blood sugar and be able to predict 10 years down the road if they're headed towards diabetes, and especially type two, and reverse that. That's cool, right? Because a client came to see me, so she said, Laura, I went, I saw my endocrinologist. He said, yeah, you're trending toward diabetes. And she said, okay, what can I do to prevent that? He said, nothing, just keep doing what you're doing. Come back and see me in six months and we'll treat you for diabetes. Great, <laughs> sign me up. That sounds like fun, right? So she came to see me and we started changing her diet, monitoring her blood sugar, going on more of a low glycemic, lower carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate diet. And she improved, she reversed. She went back and they were confused and scratching their heads and saying, hey, we don't typically see this. Well, she changed her lifestyle. So that's really, really powerful with this. So again, in certain people, not everybody, but certain people, I tend to recommend a lower glycemic fruit with people, especially if they're not going to be diligently testing their blood sugar, so we can just be on the safer end there. But things like green apples instead of red, red have a higher sugar content, pears, berries, lemons, limes, and any unripened fruit. And fruit's good, guys. I don't want you guys to fear fruit. That's a much better choice than eating pohos. You know, like, but when we're making decisions, if we're going more like lower glycemic, you're going to see that a lot of your patients have diabetes, have other health issues, they've got heart disease, they've got things going on. Healthy fats. Fats are not bad. Do not fear fats. Fat does not make you fat. Sugar makes you fat. So there's a difference there. So things like coconut oil, and I know coconut oil got a bad rap last year. Ooh, there was an article that came out and I got lots of emails about it. Okay, but yes, please rest assured, coconut oil is fine, healthy fats are fine. Ghee, which is clarified butter, so that is more in the Indian culture where those proteins have been uh, cooked to a higher temperature, those proteins are kind of sloughed off. So even if you have a dairy sensitivity, people tend to do well with ghee. You guys can see here red palm oil, lard, again from a high quality source. Same thing with beef tallow, extra virgin olive oil, avocados, coconut oils, coconuts olives, grass-fed, carry cold butter. Quality matters with your fats, quality matters with your food. So it's my recommendation that we stay away from the vegetable oils, the canola oils. Those things are very high in omega-6 fatty acids. They're very inflammatory. They're an unstable fat. Whereas these healthy fats listed here, they're much higher in omega-3, which is anti-inflammatory. So there's a difference there when looking at your healthy fats. 
nuts and seeds, these are important too, right? There's healthy fats in there as well. Now, almonds and Brazil nuts, they're higher in omega-6s. Again, that tends to be a little bit more, more on the inflammatory side, so we always want to bring a balance with everything, right? Homeostasis there. So if you're doing a lot of omega-6 high nuts and seeds, maybe balance that out with some of the others too and just be cautious with that. Again, variety is the spice of life. We don't want to just be eating all almonds, drinking almond milk, making everything with almond flour. We want to space it out and rotate our foods as much as possible too with these. And then for some, gluten-free whole grains, if tolerated. So things like gluten-free oats, and I specify gluten-free because a lot of oats are commonly cross-contaminated with gluten. So you really want to see that seal there. You really want to see that this is a certified gluten-free oat. Things like brown rice, quinoa, buckwheat groats. Some patients may need to soak their grains before cooking them. So the grains actually have a, a protective mechanism. Nature's kind of cool, right? And it protects it with that phytic acid around that. So you can actually soak your grains for 24 hours to help reduce that and it actually makes it much easier on the digestive system to be able to digest that. So that's a little tip there too. You may find that some people don't tolerate grains, but if they soak them and they have soaked and sprouted grains, they do really well with that. So it's a little tip there for your people too. And we'll talk more about gluten in just a little bit and go into that in more detail as well. Legumes and beans, again, if tolerated, some people have a sensitivity to legumes and beans. Some people don't. Some people find that if they soak them ahead of time, they do well. And there's a bioindividuality to this. I wish I could tell you, hey, here's the perfect diet for everybody. It's going to work for everybody. That would make my job way easy, <laughs> right? And you guys know there's, there's the paleo, there's vegan, there's autoimmune paleo, there's all of these different things. So it's really about working with my clients and specifying to their specific needs and what their body needs during that time. So I'm giving you generalizations here with, with everything. And sea vegetables. These are really, really good. And I encourage you to try some. Sea snacks is a great way to kind of start with that process, but things like wakame, nori, things, you know, they wrap your sushi around with that. Really high in iodine. Iodine is really, really important for thyroid health and for our thyroid hormones. So adding in more seed vegetables is really important too. You can add a little bit. You can kind of start with um, the kelp or the agar. You could put a little bit in your soup if you wanted to, to kind of ease transition into that. I used to make fun of my college roommate because she would eat seaweed all the time and it's actually a really good thing to do. I used to tell her it made the dorm stink, but she was being healthy and now I've learned better. So it's okay, eat your seed vegetables. And bone broths. So we often hear that chicken noodle soup is healing to the soul, right? Your mom's chicken noodle soup could cure any cold. There's some interesting research that actually supports that. So it's really great for gut health. It's great to improve joint health because you're having collagen in there. So collagen's really great for healthy joints, skin, hair, nails, repairing leaky gut. A really great food to help with overcoming food sensitivities and boosting that immune system. And it has a lot of minerals. And these are really easily to be absorbed into the body. So things like calcium and magnesium and phosphorus, all of these things. It's got the chondritin sulfate. You know, we usually hear of glucosamine and chondritin for joint health, right, with our osteoarthritis patients. And this could be a really great way that you could get healing from our food, right? Food is medicine, and we can start to think of it that way. But there was a study of chicken broth conducted by the University of Nebraska Medical Center and they found that the amino acids produced when making chicken stock reduced inflammation in the respiratory system and improved digestion. This is really interesting. Now any bone broth will do, but interestingly enough, the chicken and the turkey are gonna be the best. Those are higher in type two collagen as compared to the beef bones or beef stock that's gonna be higher in type one and three collagen. So if you have a choice, opt for more of the chicken and the turkey bones with that. But it's, it's always fun when research is showing us what we already knew, right? Grandma's chicken soup is really healing, and it actually is. But that's from making it from the bones, homemade, right? Not going and buying a can of soup at the store. There's a difference. So natural sweeteners. I recommend you, you know avoiding the refined sugar and opting for natural sources when you can. Avoiding those artificial sweeteners, they 
um, can do some interesting things. Some research that I read shows that they're neurotoxins, they can affect our brain, a lot of different things. So my recommendation is for sweeteners to use more of stevia. It's an herb from a plant and or erythritol or xylitol. Now, for some people, again, there's always an exception to every rule, but for some people, xylitol can be a little bit more challenging on the gut or erythritol. So if they're getting a little bit more bloating or notice some gut symptoms with that, I'll recommend switching over to stevia instead. But these are nice because they don't spike blood sugar. So that's a really nice option for people that have a sweet tooth and you're trying to get them off the sugar, but we don't want to toss them into the deep end, right, and not give them any options to sweeten their tea or different things. So you can cook with this. It works very nicely. Hydration, this is so important, guys. So, so important. So interesting research done on epidermal wound healing shows hydration status affects the inflammatory signaling at a genetic level. When I go to the research, I try to find the perfect amount of hydration. It's a little tricky. There's not a whole lot there, but the guidelines are aimed for half your body weight in ounces. Again, that's a guideline. Some patients may need more. They may need around three liters of water a day. So start slow, gradually increase. Filtered water is going to be the best with that. Avoid drinking from plastic containers if you can. There's BPA and endocrine disruptors in the plastic that can affect our fertility and, and our hormones. And constipation can actually attribute to cause more pelvic floor dysfunction. It can actually cause and create more pressure on the bladder and the urethra and can cause a stretching of the pudendal nerve due to the repetitive straining. So something as simple as just drinking more water. You know, these are things that are great for everybody. Are you going to harm somebody by telling them, hey, maybe eat some more vegetables and drink some water and lay off the McDonald's? It's really hard to make people worse, giving those recommendations, right? So these are things that you can talk to your patients about. Hey, hey, are you drinking water? Because the majority of people, guys, are drinking coffee in the morning, sodas, and then wine at night. <laughs> that's the majority of people and that's where's the water we need to stay hydrated you guys know the majority of our, wa our body is water it's important to keep those hydration levels up so I really want to stress that that's key start there talk to your patients about that this can affect their pain okay I had a patient shoulder pain patient coming in and just palpating his shoulder the muscles felt sticky. It didn't feel normal to me. It was very odd. And I asked, hey, what are you drinking? And he was living on Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I was like, are you drinking water? No, I like Dr. Pepper. Okay. And we made some goals to just start drinking more water. And it actually improved. His shoulder pain improved the muscle palpation. It was very interesting. So just something to throw in there that you may ask and talk to your patients about. Water is really, really important. Okay, and some anti-inflammatory herbs, food, and nutrients. So these are really cool. Again, things that can help with inflammation in the body. We know inflammation is a source of disease. So things like ginger and turmeric and licorice and chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, all of these things, vitamin C, the sea vegetables that we mentioned, omega-3 fatty acids, cinnamon. And this is where cooking with spices and herbs, one, it makes your food taste amazing, but two, it actually helps to reduce inflammation in the body, which is really key. So this food is medicine again, and playing with these things and getting into the kitchen, having fun can be really, really key. Omega-3s in joint pain. Interesting research with this as well. There was a review of scientific literature on omega-3s and inflammation, and this was from the Journal of American College of Nutrition in 2002, and it concluded that omega-3s in fish oil, namely the EPA and the DHA, provided beneficial to people with rheumatoid arthritis. And there was a meta-analysis of 17 randomized trials. This was from the journal Pain in 2007, and likewise it found that omega-3s in attractive adjunctive treatment for joint pain associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is something, it posed a question to me is, could this work just as well as NSAIDs to decrease joint pain? Something as simple as getting a high quality omega-3 fatty acid of fish oil for our patients to help with pain. And I've noticed this for my private clients, made a huge difference in their pain, specifically menstrual pain, dysmenorrhea, things like that, but also in their mood. They felt better. They didn't have such a tight fuse around everybody else. They noticed some changes in how they felt just by increasing their omega-3 fatty acids. So in a double-blind crossover study, 95 women who took one omega-3 capsule for three months noticed decreased intensity of dysmenorrhea and reduced ibuprofen usage.
Now this, I will say this is daily use. You can't expect to just take this around your cycle and get the benefits with that. This is regular use with this, but noticing some benefit with that. And great sources are gonna be wild caught fish, clean fish oil supplements. I do like Nordic Naturals, that brand, because it is very clean. There's a lot of rancid fish oils on the market, so do not expect to get the same results with something that you pick up at the local grocery store or pharmacy. Quality matters with this. And then things like the chia seeds, the hemp seeds, walnuts, all great sources of omega-3s. So looking at where you can get more of that into your diet. And encourage your patients to, to add before we take away, right? Because it's really scary when you go in and you say, okay, you can't have this or this or this or this. And they're going, ah, what do I eat? What am I going to do? So encourage them, add more nutrient-dense foods in. And we're going to slowly crowd out the bad stuff with that. So eating more vegetables, more leafy greens, try a new vegetable, experiment with different ways to cook with it. Okay. My husband does not like cauliflower, hates raw cauliflower. But if I roast it and put some hot sauce on it or some chili powder or something, he loves that stuff. So play with different ways to cook, make it fun. Tons of free recipes online and on Pinterest and all of those places, lots of ideas to experiment. You know, now you can make pizza crusts with cauliflower. If you can make pizza with cauliflower, what can't you do, right? The, the items are limitless here. So start with a list of foods and recipes that will add your nourishment there. Work on getting a clean protein, a healthy fat, and fiber, preferably in the form of vegetables with every single meal that is going to stabilize your blood sugar levels and keep you satiated, and drinking more water, very important. And I will say too, when we really think about it, most of what we eat is the same, right? If you really break it down, there's about 10 recipes that we go to regularly for dinner, if we really think about it. So if we make little swaps, I'm like, okay, you eat spaghetti, okay, you like that. Let's just swap it out. We can get a sauce that doesn't have any sugar added to it. We can get some grass-fed beef in there, and we can swap for maybe a spaghetti squash or a brown rice pasta. Easy, done. And then you've just empowered them, and if, if we break it down, like, instead of feeling like I need a million recipes that are healthy, let's just start with five or ten and work our way up with that. That takes the pressure off a little bit. Because this has to be doable, right? Your patients have to be able to implement that, just like with their home exercise program. If you overload them and you give them three pages of exercises to do, are they going to go and really implement that? No. We, we need to be working this, and this is where the coaching skills comes in with the physical therapy of, okay, how do we make this work in your real life? You've got a mom of three. She's got limited time. What can you really focus on? What are those big tidbits that you can give her to help her to be able to implement those things? Because if you overwhelm them, they're just going to throw their hands up and go, it's too much. So we're here to be a friend and support system for them with that. So organic food and autoimmune disease, and we'll talk about all these in more detail too, but pesticides have actually been linked to autoimmune disease. Non-organic meat contains growth hormones and antibiotics, which we mentioned a little bit, but we'll dive deeper into. And organic produce is more nutrient dense. So you're actually getting more benefit from that. So in a 2007 study, this is really interesting, 300,000 death certificates over 14 years showed farmers exposed to pesticides were more likely to die from a systemic autoimmune disease. Recent research linked household pesticides with increased risk of developing autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. There are environmental factors. Nutrigenomics is now showing that about 5% of our health is genetics and 95% is environmental factors and lifestyle. To me, that's encouraging. That tells us we have a lot of leeway in what we do and, and we get to make empowered choices, right? With what we're putting into our body. Are we exercising all of these things? And that was good news for me. I felt like, oh, wow, yeah, we can take on that responsibility for our health and healing and bring the body back into balance with that. So growth hormone and antibiotics and non-organic meat. So American livestock is regularly injected with engineered growth hormones, again, to increase the size, ramp up the milk production. It's all about the bottom line, the dollar there, right, to make more money. Growth hormones may increase insulin-like growth factor, and this can increase the risk of breast, prostate, and other cancers. Chickens, cows, and pigs, they're routinely giving antibiotics due to the susceptibility from infection because they're crowded. They're in dirty living conditions. And that frequent use of antibiotics breeds antibiotic-resistant super germs, and this affects our immune system and has a challenge fighting and dealing with these gut, 
the gut microbiome and the health there. You know, cows are meant to run free, not be all in, tied up in this little thing and getting sick and, and these living conditions. Chickens too. Chickens are supposed to eat bugs. <laughs> They're supposed to run around farms. So when we mess with nature, there are consequences with that. And for, for me, what I found in my healing journey is it's all about coming back to the basics. It's coming back to the foundations of the way that our grandparents lived in it. Our grandparents and great-grandparents, there wasn't organic and conventional. There was just food. That was it. It was all the same. Organic is more nutrient dense, so it's actually richer in nutrients and antioxidants. It's lower in heavy metals and pesticides. Good soil, again, increases that production of flavonoids, cancer-fighting compounds, which are disturbed by pesticide and herbicide use. So there is a difference there with that. There's some interesting data here. This is a, a table that kind of shows the difference in your vitamin and minerals versus the organic versus conventional with that. And you guys can kind of take a look at that. Some really interesting studies if you want to dive deeper into all of this. You can see the mineral content here, the mean percent of the organic compared to conventional crops. Right? So you may have to pay a little bit more for organic, but you're getting some benefits with that too. Because you're not, you are what you eat, but you, really you are what you absorb. What is your body actually utilizing with that? And then when we're talking toxins, so Laura Adler, she is an expert in environmental toxins. And she was talking about how there's over 54 pesticides that are used on conventionally grown strawberry crops. Nine are probable carcinogens, 24 are suspected hormone disruptors, 12 developmental or reproductive toxins, 11 neurotoxins. It gets real interesting when we start talking about the brain, right? Neurotoxins, everybody starts to kind of go, oh, okay. Uh, and 19 honeybee toxins. We need our bees, guys. We need our bees. We need to be take caring. They're what help to pollinate, help with our food production. It's really important to think about. So the Environmental Working Group, I love this, and you can check them out online. They're a great resource, but they have a clean 15 and a dirty dozen. So if you cannot afford to get organic every single time, right? You guys are grad students. <laughs> you have to make decisions, right? Money's a little tight right now. So this is a list that you can buy non-organic. So screenshot that, put it on your phone when you're going grocery shopping. These are the least pesticide residue is on these foods. So you could get them conventional. So things like avocados and corn and pineapple, cabbage, you know, usually not all, but usually these are things that, you know, have a, have a protective coating, you know, like pineapple, we cut that away and eat the inside of it. Things like that, cantaloupe, um, but again, cauliflower, broccoli. So this just helps you to make informed choices, right? And then over here we have the dirty dozen. This is always, always, always buy organic. Okay, things like strawberries and spinach and apples, these are heavily, heavily sprayed with pesticides. So if you have to make a choice and a decision, invest in these, get these organic, the rest you can get conventional with that. And it really, really does make a difference. Plus it, I think it tastes better. My husband noticed a big difference when we switched to grass-fed beef. He could tell, he was like, wow, this is better. What did you do? I was like, it's grass-fed. <laughs> it's actually from our local farmer. This is not from the grocery store and he could tell. So quality matters, because we know that these aren't the same, right? A bowl of artificially <laughs> colored cereal, it's not the same as actually eating the whole food. There's a difference. I think we're often taught a calorie is a calorie. Well, is it? What's actually being absorbed? How's our body going to be utilizing that? They're both sugar, but it's a different form of sugar, and the body utilizes it differently with that. So this is an interesting little calorie comparison too that you can see there. The broccoli, the amount of broccoli versus the gummy bears. There's a reason that we do not binge eat a bowl of broccoli, right? When you're really upset, do you just go to town and eat an entire bowl of broccoli? But you could, you could go to town on a bag of gummy bears or Doritos or Oreos. Those foods are made in a chemical they're, they're, they're made in a lab, they're smart, and they're designed to be full of fat and sugar and things that highlight and pop up in our brain and are addictive. Sugar's addictive. So that's why it's interesting, it's really hard to overeat whole foods, like celery and broccoli and, and things like that. Um, that's another good thing, you usually stop when you're full. Plus, 
you're actually absorbing vitamins and minerals and nutrients. So your body says, yeah, I'm full. But if we pump it full of sugar, it's not getting those vitamins and minerals and nutrients. So it keeps saying, no, I'm still hungry. Like you're not giving me what I need right now. All right, inflammatory foods. Stay with me, guys. Take a deep breath. We're going to go here together. I've got you. Okay, so the processed foods, the chemical additives, the gluten. In some people, not everybody, and we're going to go into these in more detail, but for some people, gluten is a very inflammatory food. Dairy, for some people. Sugar, we know sugar is not our best friend, right? The trans fats, the, you know, the things that have been fried, the canola oil, the vegetable oil, the genetically modified foods, MSG, corn, for some people, not everybody. White potatoes, for some. Nightshade vegetables, for some rice and celery, rice and uh, cereal and grains for some, those factory farm meats, poultry eggs, hate to be a Debbie Downer, but alcohol for some, okay? Alcohol turns to sugar in the body. Uh, caffeine can be kind of hard on the gut, can be kind of inflammatory. I know you guys are living on caffeine to get through. <laughs> Do the best you can. These are suggestions. Uh, baker's yeast, onions, and citrus fruit, okay? Suggestions, not for everybody, but we're going to go into more detail and, and dive a little bit deeper into this. So fats to avoid, we talked about this a little bit, but the hydrogenated oils, the shortening, the olestra, the canola oil, the vegetable oils, any oil that's not cold pressed and stored in dark containers, things that we just wanna be aware of. Again, highly inflammatory, high in omega-6 fatty acids. And then we have the top seven most common food sensitivities. I'm not talking allergies, I'm talking just a sensitivity to the body. So this is gluten, dairy, soy, sugar, corn, eggs, and peanuts. Not everybody, but some, and we're gonna dive deeper into this a little bit too. And then talking about the difference, a food sensitivity and an intolerance. So this is where, with a food sensitivity or food intolerance, I'm talking about the body's response to a normally harmless substance as if it were a threat. Okay, so the bottom's immune system is now triggered. I'm not talking about food allergy, you're going into anaphylactic shock, you need an EpiPen or be rushed to the ER. I'm just talking about the body's immune systems are triggered and functioned with that. Some other common allergens, actually allergic reactions, so things like shellfish, my husband's allergic to shellfish, tree nuts, strawberries, citrus, oats, and yeast. So again, difference between a sensitivity versus an allergen. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the role of the gut. So 70 to 80% of your immune system is actually in the gut. Your immune system fortifies your intestinal wall with the immune cells to destroy pathogens. The body is very, very cool in that way. But when you think about the digestive tract, it really is an open tube from mouth to anus, right? We need some protection going on to protect us. And food is technically not inside your body until it passes through the lining of your intestinal wall and it goes into the bloodstream with that. So leaky gut, you'll also see this in the literature known as intestinal permeability. This is when the lining of the digestive tract actually develops tiny holes that allow specific substances to pass through into the bloodstream. So as a result, some bacteria, different toxins, undigested food particles, proteins, things can leak out of the intestines into the bloodstream. And this is, causes an immune reaction because those are things that are not designed to be in our bloodstream that the body um, wants to see there, wants to be handled. So the immune system becomes hyperactive. It gets on red alert, right? This is how leaky gut is related to the immune mediated problems that are occurring in the body. And it can be a major contributor to autoimmune disease can also cause some malabsorption of vital minerals and nutrients, including zinc, iron, and B12. So Dr. Fazano, you'll see here a lot of the research by him. He's kind of the leading guy in the research with leaky gut, intestinal permeability, gluten, autoimmune disease, a lot of that stuff, this leading research that is coming out. And this may be new for a lot of you guys because I was listening to a podcast. It was, also, it was saying that a lot of our latest research on the gut and what's going on when it's by the time it gets to your family doctor they're about 17 years behind in the research 
whoa, can you imagine carrying around a cell phone 17 years old? Like, it's different, but it's hard, right? They run these family practices. It's hard for them to keep up with the latest research, be learning about these things to actually be able to implement that with their patients. So this is some new stuff that I'm excited to share with you guys, and it's becoming more and more mainstream. More and more doctors are being coming aware of this, which is really cool to see. But there's a lot of research to back this up. And this is a really cool image from Dr. Axe. I liked this, I'm a visual person. So it kind of shows this cycle that we have here when we have that intestinal inflammation of the gut lining, then that can lead to nutrient malabsorption, specifically B12, magnesium, iron, things that are really important to the body that can create an immune response, that can cause more GI issues, food intolerances, and that can lead to autoimmune disease. So it's this cycle. And this is what we're talking about. I feel like this image is really cool because it shows what's going on in a little bit better image. But we see the, the little finger-like projections there, the villi. So that helps to increase the surface area. And what happens is, for a lot of different reasons, and we'll go into those, we have the tight junctions that hold together the cell. So I forget that you guys can't see me when I'm talking clubbing and odessa. So we've got the villi that increases the surface area there. And then we have the tight junctions. So the lining of the intestinal wall, it's one cell layer thick, okay? That's kind of a fragile system when you think about it. We've got one cell layer that's protecting us. And then those tight junctions are holding everything together. So they're like the bouncers in the bar, right? They let the good guys in. They say, hey, come in. You're, you're nutrients. We need you. And they keep the bad guys out. Okay, you're a protein. You're a bacteria. You're a toxin, whatever. You need to be excreted through the body. We don't want you here. Okay, but what happens is over time can be different things, can be gluten, that could be a cause. So gluten, when you ingest gluten, it releases a chemical called zonulin. Zonulin controls those tight junctions, opening and closing, and zonulin opens them up. So that could be letting stuff in into the bloodstream that we don't really want there. That could be different medications, antibiotics. I'm not saying antibiotics are bad for everybody. There's a time and place for them. That could be things like stress. You guys aren't stressed at all, right? PT school, this is a breeze. <laughs> you got this, right? Board exams, all of this stuff. Different things can increase that intestinal permeability. So we want to look at the whole picture. This is holistic health with this. So this is what we're talking about with the nutrients, with autoimmune issues, with food intolerances, all of those things. Because if those tight junctions are broken down and things are getting into the bloodstream that's not supposed to be there, the body launches an attack. And it says, danger, danger, whoa, what's going on? This isn't supposed to be here. So this is what we're talking about with leaky gut. And I like that this image kind of shows it well. But this could be a piece of chicken. This could be, you know, a piece of a protein or food that you had that normally shouldn't cause a reaction like that. But now the body's sensitive. So it's basically almost like we poked little holes. That intestinal permeability at a microscopic level, it is, it is permeable. It is leaky. Kind of like that colander. Like things are now coming through that shouldn't be there. So lots of different causes, right? Food sensitivities can be one. A lack of chewing. We're going to talk about that more. But research is showing, and I've got the, the article towards the end, but ideally we should be chewing our food 40 times per bite. Who's doing that? Normally people chew about six times per bite. Okay, so digestion starts in the mouth. And we should ideally be liquefying our food, making it easily to be absorbed. There was one of my instructors told us about a story about a victim in the Holocaust. And, you know, they were only given so much food, tiny little pieces of food. And he would chew and chew and chew and chew and chew that tiny little piece of bread. And he survived, I think, because he was really absorbing that tiny little piece of food that he had while other people were starving. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. But... That could be a place to start with yourself. You be the inspiration for your patients, right? That's what we're here to do. But just slowing down, chewing our food, liquefying our food so that it's easily absorbed in the body is really important. So start with basics. Maybe don't even change your diet. Just chew your food really good. Weak digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes are really important. I will usually start with clients there, getting them on a good digestive enzyme. Digestive enzymes we start to produce less and less as we age. With that, again, if we're not chewing our food correctly, if we're eating distracted, all of these things can affect the absorption. So sometimes getting on a good digestive enzyme can help because they become weak. Bless you. 
Um, medications, so again, uh, people that are on pain medications for long periods of time, opioids, NSAIDs, these things. Um, physical stress, you may see this in your athletes if they're overtraining, if they've got elevated cortisol levels, people that are in chronic pain, that's hard on the body. Emotional stress, very important too. And this can overlap with autoimmunity. Again, if you're on antibiotics, I'm not saying antibiotics are a bad thing, but they are often overprescribed. Okay, if it's a viral issue, <laughs> antibiotics not really going to help you with that. Um, if it's a common cold, you know, that, that might be kind of hard on the gut. An antibiotic, the way I think of an antibiotic is you're addressing an issue with a bomb. <laughs> okay, you're putting that into your system and it's like, boom. So now it wipes out the bad gut bugs, but it also wipes out the good gut bugs. And that's where we have to come in and replenish those. Standard American Western diet. That's hard. That can cause leaky gut. I was listening to a presentation, a functional nutrition presentation, and in the research to get leaky gut, they, they did this with college kids. They would feed them McDonald's, and that's what they would do to give them leaky gut, and I thought that that was really interesting. So Western diet, there you go. That can be a contributor with leaky gut. Uh, dysbiosis. So that is when we don't have a synergy between the good gut bugs and the get bad gut bugs and the bad gut bugs overpower. We have an imbalance there that's dysbiosis. Yeast overgrowth, we also hear of candida overgrowth, um, yeast infections, but also candida overgrowth in the gut itself. Infectious bacterial overgrowth, toxin overload, lots of things that can cause leaky gut. Now, I was eating a really, really clean diet for a long time and still having fatigue and headaches and different issues. And guess what? Having an underlying Lyme disease infection will contribute to leaky gut. So it's about getting to the underlying root cause of what's going on. Food is a start. For me, nutrition was a diagnostic tool because I knew something's, something's not right with this. And I kept going, and that's how I found it. But we've got to get to those underlying layers and figure out what's going on with that. And again, this is just another image that kind of shows stress, the toxins, the food particles, different drugs, different things that can contribute to that GI inflammation, contributing to leaky gut, which can cause food intolerances because now those little pieces of chicken or whatever it is that you're eating, the immune system is on red alert with that. So now we're having immune system issues and that can in turn turn into autoimmune, autoimmunity. So you can go to PubMed in all of your free time <laughs> and search and the latest that I did here so there was over 13,000 articles on intestinal permeability uh, what I was really encouraged to see digging in the research is there's more and more on leaky gut too before you had to search intestinal permeability and now leaky gut is becoming more of a buzzword in the research too that you can find which is exciting so what do we do we go on an elimination diet this is what I recommend for my clients again those top seven food sensitivities are gluten dairy sugar soy corn peanuts and eggs this doesn't mean that you have to start and completely take all of those things out of your diet. Some of my clients will pick one and they'll start with one and they'll do that for 30 days. The sickest of my clients that are like, I will do whatever it is that you tell me to do, I just need to feel better, will do a full blown elimination diet with that. So they will take whatever that is out for 30 days and so we do a removal and then we do a reintroduction and a provocation test with that. Now, the thing with this is you have to remove it completely. It's like being pregnant, okay? You either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. You cannot be a little bit pregnant, right? So you can't have a little bit of gluten on an elimination diet <laughs> and expect that to work here. And this is the interesting thing because the inflammatory response from eating these foods, so the inflammation response, the underlying inflammation response can linger in the system for up to four weeks. Well, three to four weeks, a little bit there. So that's why I really like people to do 30 days to get a good idea. There's some research I've seen on gluten that an inflammatory response from eating gluten can last for six months. Okay. So this is why the clients that come to me and they're like, but I only eat yogurt once a week. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that inflammation can be sticking around for about three weeks after you're eating that. So that's why I really recommend 30 days, 100% elimination diet with this. And then we reintroduce one at a time, one at a time. That's really important. Please don't take all of that out for 30 days and then throw everything back in. And if you have a response, you have no idea what caused it, right? So we have to be really strategic with this. So say you took gluten out. 
Okay, we took gluten out for 30 days, then we're gonna reintroduce it. For breakfast, we're gonna have gluten, that's easy. Pancakes, cereal, toast, it's like in everything for breakfast. You notice if you have any symptoms. And because of leaky gut, because this is now um, a systemic thing and can affect the whole body, your symptoms could be headaches, your symptoms could be fatigue, it could be mood, it could be a rash, it could be blemishes on your face, it could be a lot of different things. So you monitor and you become a detective with your symptoms to see what's going on with that. If you're okay, you didn't have any symptoms, you add in more for lunch, right? Pizza, pasta, sandwiches, whatever you want there. Notice how you feel. And then same thing with dinner. Add that in, notice how you feel. First sign of symptoms, take it out. I used to have horrible, horrible acne. And three months of going gluten, dairy, sugar-free, my face completely cleared up. My skin looked better. People were like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? I was like, I'm being clean. I took out inflammatory foods from my diet. So it makes a big difference um, with that. Huge. For my clients, their cycles will regulate. Now, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And for some of this stuff, it may take about three months of removing these foods for you to really notice a difference. Okay. Now I'm just saying this is for people that have health issues, right? If you feel great, you have tons of energy, you can train well, you do all this stuff, you have no problems, no physical pain, who am I to tell you what to eat? Right? You do you. Okay. But if you're having issues, this may be something that you might consider. I was having horrible migraines in PT school. Horrible. You can ask Dr. Gearing. I would study with ice in my head. Okay. Um, there was one day that it's not, it's not Dr. Potter now. Renee, C changes, guys. You come back, everything changes. So she actually kicked me out of lab because I had ice on my head, and I was like, no, I can do it. I can do it. She was like, Lori, you have ice on your head. Go home. Like, she kicked me out of lab. And I went through so many things. <laughs> what? <laughs> you guys are wishing she would kick you out of lab. Now. Same. You got, don't come back with ice packs and tell her I told you that story. But... The thing is, I tried so many different things. I tried PT, I tried all this stuff. And then I found out through genetic testing that I had celiac disease. Wow. And, and I had an endoscopy and blood testing that told me, nope, you don't have celiac. But intuitively I knew, because I did an elimination diet, I felt like, who when I ate gluten? Okay, and then the genetics showed otherwise. So it's something to try. If you're struggling with health issues, this is something to try with an elimination diet, something to talk to your clients about, okay? Um, for me, it's gluten, dairy, and sugar with that, and your body will tell you. So I've been off gluten, dairy, sugar, what is this, like 2013 completely, and the one thing that I really, really missed was cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. The good stuff, right guys, not the stuff from the grocery store, like the good stuff. There was one cheesecake that was gluten-free, was the Godiva chocolate, yes, right, bonus. And I ate that on a vacation, this was like four years after I had taken it all out, and I got the worst migraine headache and was in bed for 24 hours. On vacation, not worth it. So your body will tell you. So I know what my symptoms are when I try to reintroduce stuff, and you get to make that choice. This is where we're informed and empowered patients, right? You can choose, is that little bit of gluten worth it or dairy? But you don't know until you take it out completely. Because if you're eating those things regularly on all the time in a, in a mixture or whatever, and you have this underlying feeling like, uh, sometimes my clients are like, gosh, I didn't realize how bad I was feeling until I took that stuff out. Because we just get used to the normal, right? So this is something that you can try. Try it with yourself, play with it, maybe uh, talk to your patients about it. But the elimination diet can be really, really powerful. And look for those symptoms all over, not just GI symptoms. We typically just think of that as constipation, diarrhea, bloating, indigestion, but because leaky gut is systemic, it's going to our blood system, it's now systemic throughout the whole body. This could be brain issues, things like depression, anxiety, ADHD, focus stuff, skin stuff, I know for me. And clinically, I will say the dairy shows up a lot in skin stuff. The eczema, the psoriasis, the acne, things like that. Thyroid issues, how many people have Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, that's like rampant now. Everybody's having thyroid problems and things. Again, the, the constipation, the diarrhea, the stuff that we think of, but adrenal insufficiency, people that just feel run down, they're tired all the time. They go to their doctor and say, hey, I'm having all this fatigue, and the doctor runs a bunch of labs and goes, I don't know what to tell ya. Um, like these are really important things to be aware of and to start looking at. Uh, joints, joint health, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, headaches, for me, I went from having a migraine about five days out of the week to now doing about two times a month. And I can control it with essential oils and magnesium and a couple things. That changed my quality of life, guys. To be honest, I don't know how I made it through PT school. By the grace of God, 
<laughs> and ice packs apparently, but um, you know, nutrition made a huge difference for me. And then frequent colds, this was another thing that I would get a lot, especially when I was working in the clinic my first couple years, you know, before I got sick, it was, it was a sign with the cancer. I was getting infections all the time, upper respiratory tract infections, sinus infection. I was in and out of the doctor's office on antibiotics and stuff all the time. I haven't had a single issue with that since changing my diet. It was a game changer for me. So indications of an elimination diet, these are things like, you know, obviously if you have an allergic reaction to something, you shouldn't be taking that. Uh, but arthritis, you know, inflammation in the body, asthma, these are things, all of these things. And you guys can look here, how many of your clients are struggling with some of these things? Chronic fatigue, okay, inability to release weight, autoimmune issues, muscle and joint pain, migraine headaches, these things uh, could be contributing to it. So it's a piece of it. I'm not saying the nutrition is an end-all be-all, but I'm saying it's a piece of it. And if you've got those, clinic, those patients in your clinic that are not getting better, it's time to start exploring some of these other options and digging deeper, maybe looking at their gut health and the food that they're eating. Oh, my full poop emoji didn't show up on this one, but I put a poop emoji there just for you guys to make sure that you're awake. Um, so Bristol stool chart, this is important, right? You would not believe how many people do not understand that they have a problem with their bowels until you show them a picture. They think that type one little deer poop type stool stuff is normal. That is not normal, okay? So it's very, very important for you to have a conversation about this. Everybody poops, it's okay. We can talk about poop, promise. And very, very important. So we want ideally a type three to four bowel movement, okay? If we're getting towards a type one, two, that's more constipation, type five, six, seven. Oh, we're making everybody uncomfortable here at the Amarillo campus. Um, but you guys wanted to talk about this after lunch, right? But this is important to talk about. So I actually recommend having this stool chart, printing it out, having it at your clinic, and showing your patients. Because you'll ask your patients, oh, do you have constipation, diarrhea? Nope. And then you're like, oh, show me what's going on here. And they're like, yep. And you're like, you're constipated. <laughs> okay? So that's giving you an idea because this is very revealing of what's going on with their gut health and how well they're absorbing their food, and how well their digestive system is functioning. And I know in the world of pelvic floor and women's health, they may be coming in with pelvic pain. It's never just about the pain or the issues. Often those patients have underlying gas, bloating, indigestion, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, IBS, a lot of other things, and that's affecting. we got to look at the body as a whole, guys. It's very important. Okay, common therapeutic elimination diets. So you're gonna see gluten-free diets, casein-free or dairy-free diets, gluten-free and casein-free, so gluten and dairy, nightshade-free, we talked about these. I just want you to be aware of them in case your patients come in and they tell you that they're on a special diet so you kinda of know what's going on with them. Let's talk about gluten. Okay, it's a huge cause of inflammation and leaky gut. And Dr. Fasano's research was showing that everyone has a temporary leaky gut after eating gluten. Everybody. You eat gluten, you have a temporary leaky gut. It's really just a matter of how well your gut health is, how well your overall health and function is as to whether or not your body has an issue with that. The gut, the lining of the gut turns over about every seven to 10 days. Why is designed to heal itself and repair that. So if you're in really good health and you don't have an issue with that, yeah, you could have gluten and do just fine. Some people, it's really hard on them and they notice other health issues. The antibodies to gluten actually attack the thyroid. So it's my recommendation if you have thyroid symptoms or you've been diagnosed with a thyroid issue that you take gluten out. I was actually able to reverse my Hashimoto's. So the antibodies that they check, that's basically like the number of bullets that are being shot at your thyroid. We you want no bullets shot at our thyroid, right? And your antibody levels can be very high. And just by going on a gluten-free diet, changing my nutrition, I reduced those antibodies. I don't have them anymore. I was able to re reverse that, which is really cool. That's an autoimmune disorder. So over 300 autoimmune diseases are associated with a sensitivity to gluten. That's just a sensitivity. That's not celiac. That's just a sensitivity with that. And I should say celiac is an autoimmune disorder. So that is where when people with celiac disease, it's a genetic issue, where when you have celiac, it will actually kill off the villi, those little finger-like guys, 
that we looked at in the intestines and caused some malabsorption and some issues and less than one eighth of a teaspoon of gluten can cause the villi to die off. So with celiac, you have to be extremely diligent about that um, and be really cautious about cross-contamination and things. So there was an interesting study, gluten and endometriosis. After 12 months, 75% reported significant improvement in symptoms. 75% just going on a gluten-free diet, no surgery with endometriosis. That's huge. Nobody got worse. So I'm just here to say it's worth a try, right? Nobody got worse. It, it could be an option. Now, I was talking to an OBGYN about this. I was like, yeah, 75% of people got better on a gluten-free diet in a year. She was like, one year? Gluten-free? I was like, these people are getting better without surgery. Like, there's something to that. So, <sighs> Some people are ready to hear this, some people are not, that's okay. Change is coming and um, I'm here to empower you, but this is some really interesting stuff, some stuff that's really exciting for me. And celiac diagnosis increases the risk of an endometriosis diagnosis. That I thought was interesting too. So with your endo patients, you may wanna ask them, hey, have you considered going on a gluten-free diet? There's some research that maybe that could help you. Nobody got worse trying that, so it's worth, it's worth a shot, right? when we're talking about conservative treatments that can really help people make a difference. So foods containing gluten, things like wheat, rye, barley, spelt, kamut, they can hide in lots of different things. I'll just highlight one, Ezekiel bread, because I get that a lot. The sprouted grains are, are becoming more popular, but there is still gluten in that. So if you're on an elimination diet, if you have celiac, I would recommend avoiding that. It's an upgrade. A sprouted bread, as we talked about, can be a little bit easier to digest and things, but there is gluten in that. So keep that out if you're doing an elimination diet with that. And it's in a lot of stuff. Gluten can hide in chocolate, in instant coffee, in lots of different things, licorice, soy sauce. So if you're on an elimination diet, you need to be a label reading gangster. Right? You need to really read your labels, really read those things, and be, be cautious. It's in, it's in our cosmetics. It's in our shampoo. I have celiac. I'm very careful about the makeup that I use, the shampoo and conditioner that I use, what I'm putting on my body. Because remember, our skin is not a raincoat. Our skin is our largest organ, and what we're putting on our skin is being absorbed transdermally. That's going into our bloodstream, too. So just things to think about. Symptoms of gluten intolerance, there's a lot. So headaches, definitely for me, that was an issue. Um, exhaustion, infertility, aching joints. You guys can read, the, of course, GI problems, but there could be different things. So for some people, might be worth it. Might be worth it. And you guys can look at these. And, you know, if you notice somebody in the clinic, it might be worth having a chat and just be like, hey, maybe, maybe consider going gluten-free and seeing if you notice a difference with that. And this was interesting too, this research study that 31% of patients with inflammatory myopathies are found to have gluten intolerance. Again, food for thought, something to be aware of with your patients in the clinic that you can ask them. Dairy, it's, it's high in sugar. It can cause problems with your gut. And dairy intolerances can present as painful digestive symptoms like bloating, heartburn, IBS, constipation skin inflammation. Clinically, I see this show up a lot with skin issues, acne, eczema, asthma. I see people that are dealing with those that they probably have an underlying dairy, um, ear aches. People are getting sick a lot. It's very mucus forming. So just something to be aware of that you could try to take out. There are some medical conditions linked to, da to dairy consumption, constipation, insulin resistance. Again, interestingly enough, it is a little bit higher in sugar. And then celiac disease diagnosis, you're more likely to be lactose intolerant. So those tend to go hand in hand a little bit for the most part. There's a higher percentage when you've got a gluten sensitivity, you might have a dairy sensitivity too. So that's good to be aware of with that. So foods containing dairy, anything with casein, with whey, with malt, if, you, if it has lacto in there, and then buzzwords that you're going to see like reading a menu or looking at things, curd, pudding, custard, and many artificial flavorings and colorings can also have dairy in there too. So we really want to read our labels carefully. And then sugar. You know, it, it's a contributing factor to a whole host of problems from thyroid issues to insulin resistance, adrenal fatigue or insufficiency, weight gain, candida overgrowth, the sugar actually feeds the candida, cancer, sugar actually feeds tumor cells. Didn't know about that until after my experience, but very interesting, right? 
sugar-sweetened beverage intake is actually correlated with an increase in endometrial cancer. And we want to work on reducing sugar intake, but this can be hard because a lot of us are addicted, right? Sugar is highly addictive. It's eight times more addictive than cocaine. It's addictive. Um, so showing yourself a lot of grace, cutting out the obvious sources, so sugar, tea, sodas, desserts, and starting to check ingredients in food items for added sugar. And if necessary, you may need to cut back on fruit for a little while. In really severe cases, when I've got clients that are really struggling with chronic yeast, uh, we may need to cut back on fruit for a little while and go to those more lower glycemic fruits that we were talking about before for them and use stevia as a replacement with that. That's really important. You can actually calculate the sugar content. So you can find the number of grams of sugar in one serving and four grams of sugar is about one teaspoon. Now, the American Heart Association recommends women consume a daily maximum of about six teaspoons. That's 24 grams of added sugar. And sugar is that beyond what food naturally contains. So it's interesting when we start looking because it's, it's hidden in a lot of stuff. There's lots of names for sugar, molasses, evaporated cane juice, honey, syrup. You know, sugar is sugar. Sugar is sugar. So the sucrose, the dextrose, the fructose, all of that is sugar. So this is kind of interesting to just show you guys what that looks like in real life. So this is the amount of sugar in a Vente 20 ounce milk and whipped cream Starbucks. This is 64 grams of sugar. Okay, and then, but we're not gonna get a Vente, right? Maybe a Grande, <laughs> okay? So we can go to all of these different ones. So we've got 20 ounces here, the Vente. This is our 60 ounces. This is 50 grams of sugar. It's kind of a lot. You wouldn't just kick this back, right? Or tell your kids, hey, just eat all this. Um, but there's so much that's kind of hidden there. This is um, what's in a 12 ounce can of Coke. But we're not usually getting a 12 ounce, right? We're getting the big super gulp, whatever the heck those things are. Um, but this is 39 grams of sugar. So this is nine and one third teaspoon of sugar. And it gets a little shocking when you're actually like measuring it out, right? When you're taking that teaspoon and putting it all into a bag. Uh, but that's interesting. And this is from 2000, this is a half a pound of sugar. This is back the data that I could find was from 2009. And this is what the average American was eating per day. I'm sure it's way more now. Um, but that's a lot. That's a lot of sugar. And again, we wouldn't just put this back and kick it back and eat that. But essentially, that's that's what we're doing. So really being aware and looking at labels and things that we're eating is uh, really key. And getting rid of the main ones going to and you don't have to worry about this so much if you're eating whole food. If you're eating food that's not in a package, it makes it a lot easier with that. But kind of shocking, kind of interesting, right? Soy. You know, soy, a lot of it's genetically modified. It can have elevated levels of formaldehyde, the genetically modified soy that is there, which is a type 1 carcinogen, likely to cause cancer. It can mimic estrogen in the body. Again, estrogen is that building up hormone in the body. Uh, I've had some clients that before they saw me, they were on soy milk and, you know, lots and lots of soy, like if, especially if they're going vegan and they're doing more plant-based protein and we're having a lot of problems with, you know, fibroids and cysts and things. Um, it is that building up there. So many pelvic pain conditions can result from, or they're worsened by estrogen dominance. And you just want to be aware of that, right? So soy hides in many processed foods. Again, focus on eating whole foods and you don't have to worry about that too, too much. And ideally, going back to more of a plant-based paleo diet. I think paleo is a good place to start, but I think people tend to go really heavy on the meats and stuff with that. And we want, again, 75% of our plate to be vegetables. That's really important for us. Adding in those clean proteins, a little bit of nuts and seeds is a really great place to start as just a general recommendation. But we need to find what works best for each person. I have some clients that thrive on a vegan diet. I have some that don't have some that thrive on a paleo diet and some that don't. So these are baselines for everybody, but I really encourage people to be detectives and biohack and find what works best for them and what diet they feel best on because there is that bioindividuality that we want to be aware of. So individualizing your nutrition is going to be very, very important. And 
you know, because there's lots of different things, right? There's biochemical individuality. We're going through different phases of life. You know, if there's exposures to things, the genetics or gender, all of those things, the activity level, you may need to be get way more calories in if you're an athlete than if you're a more sedentary person. So really tweaking things to meet your needs is really, really important with this and finding what works best. So again, just some overall nutrition recommendations, whole foods, Fresh is great. If you can get it fresh rather than a can, that's going to be ideal. There's going to be more digestive enzymes, more probiotics, more things to help you break down your food that way. Nutrient-dense, organic if you can, or looking at that dirty dozen in the clean 15 list to help you make informed decisions when you're shopping with those things. And essential fats, they're important. And again, free of preservatives, additives, the GMOs, things like that. Some more basic principles. Ideally, you want to avoid a high carbohydrate breakfast. Going a little bit more lower carb for breakfast is ideal. The standard American diet doesn't really show us that, right? It's lots of cereal and pancakes and toast and things. Um, but doing more of like a, a green smoothie where you've got a really clean protein powder in there and throwing in some leafy greens and maybe some berries, something like that. Um, I like to do like a collagen powder with that to help boost up the protein and then collagen helps with leaky gut or something simple like a, a vegetable omelet if you can tolerate eggs and you're doing okay with those. Um, I love to do leftovers from the night before. We can rethink breakfast. Breakfast can be meal one of the day. You can have your dinner left over and eat that and it can be really great and people notice that they start to feel better and their energy levels go longer and they're not crashing and reaching for sugar at 10 a.m. Or the next thing that ideally when we're eating what works best for us, we can go four to five hours without having to snack and get hungry if your blood sugar levels are working well. So that's just something to think about. Again, avoiding allergens and sensitivities, the refined foods, chewing your food really, really well, drinking lots of water, more of an alkalizing diet. Again, we're working on inflammation, lots of plants, lots of vegetables, organic food, and then for some, we need to think about the, the caffeine, the alcohol, the sugar. You know, caffeine is, it's like a high interest loan. You have to pay that back eventually. Like we're taking that for a boost, but then sometimes we're kind of getting tanked and we're going back to the caffeine or the sugar. It's a little taxing on our adrenal glands. Alcohol turns into sugar. So a lot of us are self-medicating with coffee in the morning and to get us going and alcohol at night to help us wind down. Uh, and it's just something to be aware of you know, with where you are in your healing journey with those things and sugar. Getting exercise, you guys know that. You guys are the experts in mus the musculoskeletal system and movement and all of that. Sleep, so important. One night of poor sleep can make you more insulin resistant the following day. Sleep is the number one cause of fatigue and, and feeling burned out. So remember that, guys. As you're cramming and studying for stuff, like really be cognizant of your sleep and maybe even ask your patients about sleep because it can affect their pain. It can affect their blood sugar levels. We're looking at people holistically. It's that whole picture. Consider going gluten-free if you have some of the symptoms that were mentioned. If you're struggling with a health issue, it can be a game changer for you. It was for me. And keep your blood sugar levels balanced, ideally. And that helps when you're eating the clean fat, the protein, and the fiber. That combination works really well to keep you satiated and keep those blood sugar levels from from spiking, right? Because when we're having something like, um, you know, the standard American diet, cereal, toast, donut, whatever you want to call it, shoot your blood sugar up really, really high, and then you crash, boom, you come down, and that energy's gone. So you're going for the next thing, right? The power drinks, the whatever, and then crash. This is the blood sugar roller coaster where if we're eating balanced food, whatever you eat is going to increase your blood sugar, but ideally we have these little spikes and then it kind of comes down and we stay normal. We're not going into these big up and downs. And you feel that, right? We've all been on that roller coaster ride of eating lots of candy or donuts or whatever and then having that energy crash. So you're getting that temporary relief, but then you feel even more depleted after. So just something to kind of think about there too. And load up on the fresh foods. Really important. And I encourage you guys to be the inspiration for your patients. You know, carry your water bottle around. Have that with you. Talk to them about hydration and what they're eating. They're going to follow your lead on that, right? They trust you. You've built that relationship with them. And then tips to enhance your digestion. 
praying or showing gratitude before eating is really, really, really powerful or taking some deep breaths. So this helps to put you in that calming state to actually digest your food. If you're in a stressed out state, your body's not gonna be able to absorb that completely. So putting you in more of a parasympathetic state where you can rest and digest and eat. Again, eating in a calm state and then chewing your food well. There's that research article for you guys on the 40 chews per bite. I mean, you know, don't go and try to do that right away, but, but be cognizant, chew, slow down, take some deep breaths, eat your meals, and then just see what your normal is and just work on liquefying your food. You're gonna get better absorption. For some of my clients, just working with chewing really well and not even changing their diet made a difference in bloating and GI symptoms and, and gas, like foundations, hydration. Are you chewing your food well? Are you eating in a stressed out state? All of those things are really, really important. And then, you know, don't, don't eat when you're distracted, and that's hard, right? We want to be on our phones. We're in this technology age, but slowing down, avoiding rushing, avoiding eating in the car, stuff, dining rather than eating, really, if you can, take the time, set the table, even if you could do that with one meal where you just sit and you eat and you're present for your food can help with your digestion. That's, that's the big takeaway that I want to say with this. Like, take one thing from this talk today. We talked about a lot of stuff. Take one thing that you can implement for yourself. Maybe that's drinking more water. Maybe that's chewing your food. But start there, and those small changes add up to big ones. That's why with my private health coaching clients, I do not put them on an elimination diet right out of the gate. They're going to run for the hills. They're never going to come back and see me. They're going to be like, this chick is crazy. Okay, slow, adding in more water, adding in more vegetables. We build the foundation up is really, really important with that. And eat with pleasant people. <laughs> in a soothing environment, right? This is not the time to have a discussion about stressful things or be around toxic negative people, all of these things. It's, it's important. It's important to slow down when we're eating. For some people, doing a teaspoon of Bragg's apple cider vinegar, you want the Bragg's. It's got the mother. It's got those probiotics in there. That's the gross stuff around the bottom of the, of the bottle. That's what you want. That is good. It's not gross. It looks a little gross, but it's going to help you. So doing just a teaspoon and working up to a tablespoon, and you can add that in water and drink that, game changer. I cannot tell you how many of my clients that their acid reflux, their issues, their bloating after meals went away with just adding that in. That's simple, that's inexpensive, and that's a really easy way to help them because a lot of people think with acid reflux it's too much acid, it's actually your, your hydrochloric acid in the stomach is not producing enough. It's a lack of acid to break that down, which is important. Um, again, if you're having trouble still digesting and you've implemented all of these things, try a digestive enzyme. That can be a really, really big help with people, um, especially if you're doing a lot of more, more protein. If you're eating a, a raw plant-based diet, you're getting a lot of digestive enzymes in that, you may not need it, but if you're doing more protein or things, you may want to add in that digestive enzyme. And probiotics. And look for one that has a variety of different strains in there to help. We want to help replenish those good gut bugs. And then this is just pillars for optimal health, right? Eating real whole foods, staying hydrated with clean filtered water, finding some form of movement you love to do and do it daily, taking time for rest and pleasure. This is so important, guys. This is, these are the pillars. So nutrition is a, a pillar. It's important, right? But we also have movement. We also have stress management. We also have sleep and finding joy and pleasure in life, finding your why. That's really, really, really important. Laughter is the best medicine, so finding something to laugh at, breathing, those big, deep, diaphragmatic breaths. Um, my nephew was born yesterday. I got to go see him at the hospital. It was really exciting. And I was just watching him in awe, and you watch babies. And they just breathe. They've got that big, deep belly breath. They do it naturally. And so many of us don't. We're stressed out. We're, we're breathing up here. We're chest breathers and having all these issues. Just, just working on breath. Coming back to the basics is really important and staying in the present moment. All of these are really, really key. So what to look for in your patients? How can you implement this into the clinic, into what you're doing? Ask general questions about their nutrition and diet. Hey, are you on any special diets? What are you doing for those? Are you staying hydrated? Are you drinking half of your body weight in water each day? Show them the Bristol stool chart. Have a discussion. Hey, what are your bowel movements looking like? And show them the chart because they'll tell you nothing's wrong and then they'll point out, I, I promise you, it's, it's shocking, but 
get the chart out, talk to them about their bowel movements. Hey, what's your digestion like? Do you have gas or bloating after you eat? Are you uncomfortable? A lot of people think that's normal. Maybe they've had that for their whole life and they don't understand that, oh, wow, I've been constipated for my whole life and I have pain after eating and that's not normal. And we can start to help them with that. Hey, are they taking a vitamin D supplement or a fish oil supplement? Maybe that's something that can help them with their mood, with their joint pain, with different things. We're, we're the people that they come to, right? They're seeing us a lot. And physical therapy is huge, but it's a piece of the puzzle. And this is something to think about when, you know, 75% of your patients are doing so good and there's that, that small percentage that you're racking your brain and thinking of all these things and you're talking to people and you're like, ah, oh, what's going on? This could be a piece of the puzzle. So ask these questions. What's their lifestyle like? Are they getting enough sleep and rest? Are they doing some form of daily movement? This is where the home exercise program comes in. You can talk to them about that. Are they doing work they enjoy? How's their stress level? That's going to impact their PT outcomes, guys. Implementing this in their daily life, 100%. Do they have tools to manage their stress? What are their relationships like? There's a patient of mine in the clinic. She had chronic neck pain. And she would come in, and I could do some things. I could do some traction. I could do some manual therapy work with her. And her pain would go away temporarily. But she would come in, and she she hated her job. And she would walk in. She would like, oh, my gosh, I was just at work. And, no, 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 no. and she's talking about work, and she's just like, I was like, woo, okay, okay, I'm, I'm getting a feeling for this. Do you think that what I'm doing in the PT clinic is going to have lasting results if this woman absolutely hates her job? Probably not. You know, we're a tool, we're a person, but I think it's important and I want you guys to know this because this is an important lesson that I didn't know. You are not their healer. Okay, I'm going to say that again. You are not their healer. You're a guide, you're there to teach, you're there to educate, but ultimately the responsibility for healing comes from ourselves. We're here to heal our bodies. That's, that's our responsibility. We take that away from people. So you are the CEO of your health and healing. So you're a tool, um, but you can, you, know, you can kind of talk to them a little bit about that. But for some people, for me to heal, I had to completely change my life. I had to completely change my diet. I had to change what I was doing. I had to get rid of negative people. So I want you guys to remember that because I think so many times, and I would do this in the clinic, I felt like, oh my gosh, this person isn't getting better. I'm a horrible PT. Like, what am I missing? What am I not doing? Da 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 da. And if a patient got better, it was all on them. I was like, congratulations, you did amazing. You did your home exercise program and you're graduating. This is great. But if the patient didn't get better, I would feel like, oh, what did I do wrong? What am I overlooking? What am I missing? And I want you just to step away from that responsibility right now because you're a guide, you're a tool, and I'm giving you some other tools in your toolbox besides just the PT that could help and implement and ask questions. But this is really important because if they're in a super stressed out relationship or they absolutely hate their job or something else is going on, that's going to affect everything else. It's going to affect their hormones. That's going to affect leaky gut, right? Stress we talked about could be a cause of leaky gut. All of these things. And this is where you, sometimes you have to have a conversation with them and be like, okay, every time you come in and talk about your job, everything gets stressed out and tied up and, you know, I can do some stuff temporarily. I can teach you a home exercise program, but let's start to look at everything holistically. When do you have pain? When does your pain get better? Interestingly enough, I had a pelvic pain patient and um, her spouse would travel and the pain got worse when her husband was in town and the pain got better when he was gone. Okay, it's interesting. Tell me about your relationship. What's kind of going on there? Again, we need to ask questions. Ask questions. Start figuring out stuff. There are musculoskeletal problems with things, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's looking at people holistically. That functional approach is really, really key. Okay, so we have some case studies for you guys. Really quick. So we have a ballet dancer with hip pain. So a 17-year-old female dancer. She presents to the ER with fatigue, weight loss, amenorrhea, right hip pain, groin and knee pain, and back pain. She was seen in PT for treatment of iliopsoas and spine pain for a few months prior, and she made some improvements in PT, which is good. She was also previously diagnosed with anemia, and they started her on an iron supplement. CT scan and surgery. So they found an abscess in her iliopsoas and inflammation of the terminal ilium and cecum and multiple bowel perforations. So there was a treatment follow-up for Crohn's disease, and it rendered her healthy at a year follow-up. 
So this is just, it's kind of interesting, right? She went to PT, she got a little bit better, but an underlying diagnosis of Crohn's came up. So this is where asking those questions, looking at it holistically, that was a piece of her healing that was going on with that. So another case study, low back pain and pelvic and joint pain, 41 year old female with Crohn's disease presents with a chronic history of low back pain and pelvic and joint pain, a history of traumatic spine and pelvic fracture, an MBA, and coccyx fracture during delivery of her only child. She is stressed by her slow recovery from delivery and being newly at home with her 18 month old daughter. How might you consider nutrition as a role in her recovery? Well, Crohn's typically responds to a paleo diet approach. We want to crowd out the sugar and the grains. Again, an anti-inflammatory diet. Bone broth can be a really, really great thing to do to increase the minerals. It's great for leaky gut, help with that collagen. And then start to ask some questions. Hey, does anybody help you cook? Can anyone watch your baby while you're doing a home exercise program? What's your support system look like? What's your web of support? How can we help you with this? Um, and maybe collaborating with a nutritionist, a health coach, getting these people in, her family doctor, her ob -GYN, all these people to support her is, is really, really key. So asking those questions. And again, fear is not a very good motivating factor. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit. So there was some research that I was reading about people that have heart attacks. And they'll go to their doctor and their doctor will tell them, hey, you have to change your diet or you're going to die again. You're, you're going to have a heart attack and, and die. And fear as a motivating factor only lasted for about 90 days. And then they were back to just eating whatever they were doing before, doing the same stuff. So what I find is it's really important to tune people into their why, right? This is the coaching that comes. Like, are they being compliant with their home exercise programs? You know, get them in tune with their why. Why do they want it? Like, what's going on? You know, it's one thing to say, okay, well, I want to get rid of my knee pain. Well, why? I want to be able to sit on the floor and play with my grandkids. There's your why. Let's talk about that. Let's implement that into your home exercise program to motivate them. You got to find that big why, their big vision, that bigger thing. It's easier with athletes, right? Athletes are in tune with their why. They know they're super compliant with their home exercise program too. But how can we pull that in with the average person and work with them and make this work?